Today's episode is sponsored by Future State Media, experts in off Amazon traffic for Amazon sellers. Future State Media will build you a custom made website to deliver sales for you on Amazon. Built to grab traffic from search engines and social media, your site can be used as a secret weapon for launching products on Amazon or just to stabilize your Amazon sales. It means you can also build an email list on autopilot. Go to futurestatemedia.com for your free guide to Google SEO for Amazon sellers today. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Amazing FBA. This is your host, Michael Beasy. Today, I'm delighted to welcome back Fernando Cruz of Marketplace Ops and Pixelfy. Um, Marketplace Ops supercharge Amazon sales for brands by managing their accounts. And almost like a, a side note, uh, which is what we're going to dig in today, Fernando's built an eight-figure Amazon business with his partner and a team in three years. And that's what we're going to dig into today, the, the team building thing, which is always a great topic. So Fernando, warm welcome back, first of all. Thanks, man. I appreciate you having me, Michael. Yeah, it's, it's great, great to talk to somebody who's uh, achieved such a, a great result in a short time. And um, where are you coming to us from, by the way? Are you in sunny California there? Uh, not super sunny, but yeah, in Southern California. I'm in LA. Actually. Excellent. Yeah, a lot of, a lot of uh, our um, guests end up being from the Pacific so the coast for some okay. reason is a hot bread of, of um, things. And I know that we talked in the last episode about the fact that you came from a, a background where the idea of venture capital and, and super scaling was, was kind of a comfort zone. So and I think that interestingly changes the discussion as well. But today we're going to talk um, about team. So I know that you've got a team of what, about 40 people on these days? Is that what you're up to? Uh, yeah, we've been as high as 80, but yeah, now we're like uh, oh, wow. we're probably in the 40s. Um, yeah, we yeah we have a pretty large size team, I guess. Yeah, wow. So you've obviously you built that from from just you and your business partner up what three years ago? Is that about right? Uh, sorry, we started in 2015, 2015. Uh, on Amazon. Okay, yeah. so but still, it's it's quite a substantial change. So. Um, so the first question is, um, we were talking about this, I mean, in, in terms of sort of big picture to small picture, we were talking about process versus team, which I'm kind of a stupid distinction in a way, but um, I was sort of pushing you to go, what's your SOPs, what's your where structuring? And you go, well, can we talk about teams? So first question then is, um, it, it, what should you start with? Uh, do you start with a process? Do you start with getting hold of a person and then developing? Where, what's your starting point with this? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I do think in the early days, it's important, you know, for you to kind of understand your business and like kind of figure out uh, some of the process. But I think, at least for me, like, I'm not a very like great process person, to be honest, like, I don't document anything. Uh, my like, everything is pretty messy on my desk in terms of notes and, and everything. I, I keep notes in way, a lot of different places. And so I just know that's not specifically like my skill set. And so, you know, you, I think you should focus on your strengths. And so it's hiring people around you that are more process driven. And so that's, I guess, why I like focus so much more on team is just like, you know, you can't be good at everything and you could really focus on trying to become better at things, which I think is, you know, is a good thing to do. But I think, you know, hiring people around yourself that can complement that, um, I guess that weakness, if you will, uh, is is probably a better approach, in my opinion. Makes sense. Okay, so if you're not sort of particularly driven by you know process or process, as we say in states, um, what was your starting point? I mean, you you obviously um, started with your business partner, and I know you had some investors or some some debt uh, investors, mm -hmm. if that's the right word. <laughs> yeah. Um, but what what was the inflection point? What when did you? What caused you to make your first hire? Why bother with the team is another way of putting it. Yeah. So we made our first hires in maybe like seven months in. Uh, and they were overseas. So people uh, in the Philippines that were recommended to us. Um, and yeah, I mean, so I think about it in terms of like the kind of value of the tasks that you're working on. You know what I mean? And so like, you know, within an Amazon business, there's like a lot of repeatable tasks, right? There's like, you know, your product selection, your sourcing, customer support, uh, the administrative side of the business. Um, and I, I think, you know, those are kind of varying levels of like difficulty and like, you know, they kind of have like an assigned value, right? Maybe like customer support and administrative stuff is, is a little bit lower than like product development and sourcing, just like just speaking generally. And, uh, you know, and I think, uh, above both of those, I guess, in terms of like 
value or like a value per hour would probably be like, you know, the more like strategic thinking, like, you know, um, managing like your strategic, uh, your financial planning, like, uh, things that only like, you know, owners a lot of the time can do hiring, I think is a very like high value task. And so the way I always thought about it was, okay, like how much would it cost me to outsource this specific function? And if it's less than like 50 bucks an hour, like I'm going to get rid of it. And so just constantly remove, like kind of, uh, removing those responsibilities from myself. And then just over time, as we got bigger and bigger, like I, that, that dollar per hour that I would outsource just kept going higher and higher because I just put like a uh, higher value on my time. And yeah, I don't know what it is now, maybe like 500 an hour, but it's like, okay, if I can get somebody uh, to do a better job uh, in less time, then I can focus on really figuring out where the company needs to go for the next like 12 months or 36 months. And I think it's a better um, way of utilizing my time. It's fascinating to me how um, when people have their favorite thing that they're comfortable with um, or just drawn to, or whatever you would call it, um, they say to a man with a nail, everything looks, uh, to a man with a hammer, sorry, everything looks like a nail. And, and mm -hmm. um, if you love people, then you see uh, a problem and you look at the value of your time versus the, the cost of a VA and hire a VA. And a lot of people, um, We'll build a business to certainly around the million dollar a year uh, run rate mark or a little bit above, I've seen 1.5 where with no VA sometimes, but they love that automation. So that's another mm -hmm. option, I guess. It's, it's always interesting to me. And I don't think one is right or wrong, but as you said, uh, quite just simple idea, but focusing on your strengths, which I guess is what's been driving your entire uh, business. But I guess the difference between you and most people is you put a pretty high value on your your hour pretty early. I mean, $50 an hour isn't a fortune, but of course it's going to be an overhead to your business that, mm -hmm. that you know, $50 an hour times however many hours a week for somebody going to add up quite swiftly. So what, mm -hmm. how did you, I mean, I suppose that this, this, I don't know exactly the right way to put it, but I suppose if you're risk averse, how did you justify that, um, <laughs> that spend? Did you not, because I know you came from the, the Shopify adventure that you had five months where nothing had really worked for you. So, um, then a few months later, you're willing to put $50 per hour value on, on tasks and get rid of those, anything below that value. How did you transition from one situational mentality to another? Right. So, I mean, just, just because of that's like my threshold, that doesn't mean that like most of the tasks like were at that rate, right? I would say like the majority were probably in the like three to $5 range, to be honest. Uh, and, but I mean, I, I think it's just, you know, what you're willing to pay, um, you know, specific people like, you know, we would pay photographers, I think really well. And it's like, yeah, we could go, uh, yeah, probably closer than that $50 range. And it's like, yeah, we could go learn photography and try to do it, but are we going to do it as well? Is it going to be like a fun process for me or is it going to be more of a frustrating process? Uh, and it's not going to come out as well as like, you know, hiring a photographer that's got years of experience, the right technical equipment, and, and everything else. And so I think, uh, yeah, I mean, I would say the majority of the tasks like that we were pushing off, but is it there like at the time I was just willing to go up to like 50 bucks an hour, then like, you know, then to eventually to a hundred, uh, things like that, because I knew that there was a better return on my time. Like if I could find uh, one more product that would generate, let's call it like, yeah, five grand in profit a month, like, like how long would it take me to find that? And then it's like, okay, like kind of doing the math that way was just better to me to spend my time on than like trying to learn photography or trying to learn these specific skill sets that had like a, a big learning curve. Yeah, that, that does make sense on paper, but I guess the difference between you and a lot of us, my, myself included, some of the times that you actually did it. So what gave you the... Uh, what gave you the faith is the word I suppose I'm looking for that you were going to be able to get a return on your own time by doing say product development because one of those things about the private label strategy or, or you know business models better way of putting it or customization similar things is that obviously quite a lot of products don't work out the way we um, imagine and I reference um, the the previous episode if you go to amazingfba.com forward slash Fernando C um, C for Cruz then you'll you'll find the other episode which is in possibly good thing to listen to for context because i know that you said like it was only about the seventh product that you you uh, launched that really took off mm -hmm. um so where I, I don't 
know the exact question I'm asking exactly, except how do you find the faith in yourself that is justified to spend that money, I guess is what I'm saying. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I mean, we had, to be fair, we, we had a lot of success by the time that we started making that first hire. I, I to put it in context. I think we were doing maybe like $80,000 a month in revenue. And so I guess in the grand scheme of things, I thought it was a little bit late. I wish I would have done it probably a little bit earlier. Um, yeah. Uh, I mean, in terms of the, the faith, uh, I, I think it's just really valuing your time. Like, yeah, truthfully, like the way that it came up, our first hire was like my business partner. Um, he was handling Nick and who you're talking to soon. I uh, was handling a lot of our like customer support and I was like, dude, you're like, this is a way, like not a waste of your time, but it's just not like, we can definitely like utilize you like, in such a better way than doing the support. Let's like, let's get somebody in the Philippines uh, or like, you know, another like great country um, where we can kind of outsource this and then they can specifically focus on a lot of these tasks. Uh, they'll do a great job, set up our SOPs, things like that. And then we can focus on, like, yeah, how do we continue to grow the business? Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I, I think, uh, yeah, it, it just, context is, like, is important. Yeah, we were very like profitable at the time. And so like, I think it was kind of an obvious one for us. Yeah, well, I guess it's interesting. I mean, like you say, you, you almost left it too late, but at least you didn't have any mental anguish about it or hire somebody and then regret it. Because I know I've done that and I've seen other people that they, they kind of, it's very easy to go the opposite extreme and hire people because that's what real businesses have. And, you know, people get offices sometimes they really don't need or, right. you know, staff. And then because it makes you feel legitimate and then actually you realize it's just draining money and not producing value, but you, you are the opposite extreme, I guess, and that you were really profitable. And yeah, I could see that obviously you and your business partner, very sharp people and you, cause it's obvious that you'd have the results. So, Okay, so you 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 first hired for customer service by the sound of it. What was what was the process for your next hiring? Did you sort of just hire out things as and when you got fed up with them, or did you have a plan? How did that actually work in reality? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I think at the time, you know, we Nick and I were doing kind of a little bit of everything, and then we just started kind of taking a step back and really focusing on like, okay what are gonna be the big levers for the private label business? And so the way that we kind of thought about it was like, one is kind of the operations of like supply chain is gonna be a really big part. And so that's gonna be everything from like working with the freight forwarders, to like the logistics, inventory planning, uh, and like in sourcing. And then we thought like product development side would be another big, uh, I guess, lever for growth. And so those were the next two hires that we brought on and we actually brought them on here. Uh, and so, um, that was, yeah, it, it was definitely a really good experience. Like they were, they were great hires. Um, and they really helped us again, like start standardizing like our, our process. Um, you know, for, at least for me in product development, even though it was what, like when I was managing it, it was, uh, you know, what excited me the most but it was always kind of like when I have free time, right? Cause I had to take out all these other, other responsibilities, but it's like, okay, well, if you have somebody dedicated towards it and they don't have other conflicting things like competing for time, then like they can hit like a certain amount of products per month. And then, so it's like, okay, let's bring in someone for that specific piece. Uh, but like, you know, they're going to need some type of like operational support to be able to introduce those many, uh, that many products. And so let's bring in someone specifically to oversee supply chain. And so that's kind of how we looked at it. Great. So you brought in somebody. Um, yeah, well, it makes sense. If you're going to develop products, then the next thing is, okay, how are you going to get them? And how are you going to source them? How are you going to get them delivered? How are you going to deal with uh, shepherding it through, you know, whatever um, Trump and, and the Chinese leadership come up with in terms of, tra tra you know, the next taxes or yeah. whatever, or let alone COVID obviously is a massive challenge to logistics, I know. But e even though it's a special situation, it's an extreme form of what can happen. I mean, for example, I know that, um, I can't remember what, what the company was called, but there was there was a company hmm, four years ago, maybe, and might have even involved you. I mean, quite a few people had uh, stuff on one of the, I think it was a Korean shipping line that had something like six, one sixth of the entire world's capacity for shipping went bankrupt. Okay. And that okay. was pretty insane. <laughs> 
you remember that one? Yeah, I do. I do. Yeah, I wasn't thankfully us, uh, but yeah, I did hear about it. Yeah, not, I had a client who had stuff stuck at the water for ages. A friend of mine who had stuff that literally, I think they went from China. They they went all the way over to US, probably Port of LA. And mm. then they got turned away and they went all the way back to China <laughs> with the product and took it back to the factory. You know, how frustrating is that? So yeah, it's not COVID-19 for the entire globe. But if that's your product and your business is is not only not getting sales, but has put the money down for the products, it's, it's a massive cash flow problem. That could kill a business. So yeah, you, you've got to have a robust um way of dealing with this stuff haven't you i suppose i'm, I'm going <laughs> i don't know why i'm escalating from uh, you hiring a second person to suddenly you know uh, but I, I suppose what i'm saying is um you've got to have a plan because uh, you can't just drift along and hope because the world isn't very kind to you and it's interesting that you, you were saying um you didn't get around to doing it I, I find um for example very 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 small thing i'm just getting my va to put together a load of videos to put on youtube because i realized i recorded quite a lot of content which included by the way your last podcast so that's gone <laughs> on youtube now mm. and um which wasn't getting it on there because i just didn't have time and it took me ages to sort out the process because i had to clean up the process and as a result even if he disappears tomorrow i'll have a cleaner process myself but it was having to explain it and hand it over to somebody else forced me to clean up the process so maybe mm. i have a similar relationship to processes and team as you which is I'm a team person first and process follows because I want to communicate it. Is that how you found that works for you as well? Uh, yeah, that's, yeah, it's interesting. Um, that's a good. Yeah. I never, I never spent a lot of time reflecting about it, but yeah, I think it's, um, you know, over the years, I think it probably just got a little bit lazier to be t t totally honest. And so I think, yeah, it just comes down to, yeah, I can, I can do the process and I'm sure figure things out, but to me is that most most tasks and responsibilities will recur and so i'd rather bring in somebody that's going to be dedicated towards it and and really focus on like managing it improving it and that's just really not my like skill set like i think i'm good at coming up with the idea getting it off the ground in the beginning but not super structured but i can prove something out and then like really hire somebody to like really build it I, and that was kind of the early days. Now it's just way easier for me to like find that, that right person that has that exact background that I'm looking for. that's already done it before and then bring them in specifically to kind of like oversee the, like the entire initiative that I want to build. And I mean, obviously that's gonna, you know, as, as you get larger then you, you kind of transition from, uh, from, I guess, hiring people with like a lot of potential that you can kind of teach and then kind of groom versus like, trying to find people that have already done before. Um, and so that's kind of, I guess, how we've thought about it. Yeah, that does make sense. And I guess um, the more you hire a professional who knows what they're doing, the less management you've got to do, really. And it, it makes sense that, right. I guess that there's that interesting thing. I think it's quite a healthy thing. You start off doing stuff yourself because you know what's going on in your own business, right? And especially if you're not very process-driven like me, you can get quite lazy. Right. And then when you have to delegate, you go, oh, actually, yeah, that's a good question. We don't do that, but we should. And in response right. to questions from a VA. But then the next thing is, I guess people who are pre-trained are more expensive, right? But they hit the ground running, so there's less of your time. So again, it's the time value um, versus the money equation, I guess, isn't that payoff? So so how did you transition there? You, you've got yourself um, somebody doing customer service then, you've got somebody doing product development and somebody supporting them in sourcing logistics. What mm -hmm. was the next sort of phase of planning, of hiring, I should say? Yeah, so the next phase was hiring uh, people below our team uh, here. So like, yeah, basically they became kind of managers um, and we brought in like, you know, product development people, sourcing people, um yeah and kind of like a logistics person like underneath those specific teams and uh that i think was really where we started to see improvement because it kind of elevated the roles of the people here into more yeah managerial roles instead of uh instead of specifically like kind of executors and allowed them to really focus on, uh, on more of the strategy and, and process and figuring out how are we going to like really scale, you know, to 10, 20, like X, you know, million. Um, I, I think those were some of the big changes that we made. So, um, that's interesting. So we, you, you had people in uh, California managing and um, were they managing a remote team in, uh, 
Philippines or were they also exactly. based in? Yeah, okay, right. Interesting. So why did you decide to hire in California to a degree that I'm assuming California or somewhere in the States? What, what, what was the base of that decision? It's a good question. Um, yeah, the, the people in California, we had, um, we, yeah, we, you know, had some kind of like mutual like uh, friends or like, you know, they had like good backgrounds or like, you know, at, at the time we didn't really know if we could hire very like high level people in the Philippines, which now like, I, of course, uh, we know different, like a lot of our like best leaders are actually over in the Philippines. But at the time, we weren't really confident in our ability to do that. I think when we first started out, um, you know, we were just really focused on hiring like more of the administrative tasks um, overseas. And then, um, yeah, as we started hiring like, you know, great, great, um, like more and more like honestly super talented team members over there, we kind of started shifting of like, okay, like there, there was a, definitely an epiphany moment where it was like, wow like our team over there is incredible like why are we hiring in the u.s where it's way more expensive uh we should just really focus on hiring people from super large companies in the philippines that have a lot of experience and then recruit them and then you know offer like you know i you know kind of the startup culture you're gonna get a ton of responsibility you can work from home and for those that don't know like if you're in manila for instance your traffic i mean probably not right now obviously during COVID 19 but like normally is like, you know, two hours each way. And so you can save somebody and is in a super family oriented culture. So you can get them to like save like four hours of their day uh, where they place a huge value on spending time with family uh, by offering them, you know, a work from home job. And so it was actually, we realized it's very easy to recruit people. Uh, and then also like, yeah, you know, offering people more responsibility, um autonomy and then also uh it's kind of a weird loophole but like just because you know they're technically contractors i know a lot of people don't necessarily have to report like their um like personal income things like that like versus like working for like a company registered in the philippines so yeah i think there's overall and that's not legal advice i, I should, <laughs> it's fine we don't that. take it as legal uh, advice no that's fine uh but um but yeah i mean you should definitely like yeah there's definitely uh, a lot of reasons that you can get somebody to switch over to working with you. Mm. Um, and yeah, that's where I think things really started to scale. So you really headhunted then. Uh, I, it, it's quite interesting. I've never kind of crossed that, that culture of doing it before, but it makes total sense. I mean, especially what you're saying about the community in Manila, which I, sounds a bit like commuting in and out of London. I mean, it's probably similar in a lot of big cities. I know LA has got a huge traffic issue, right? So well, yeah, that's so interesting. And yeah, you're right. They have a massive family value, value on family. But yeah, I've also had, again, on a much smaller scale, but I'm pleasantly amazed by the quality of some of the Filipinos I've worked with. I mean, it's, you know, it varies a lot, like any anything else. But like this one lady, um, Shalisa, I've been working for, I'm to call her out. I and mean, she's still working for me in the sense, but she's on sabbatical, hopefully getting married, although I'm not sure how that's going to work for her. But, you know, I, I agreed that she's put in somebody else who she actually trained up and who she's worked with before. And like the quality of the communication, the quality of her English alone is better than most English or Americans. I mean, really fantastically fluent english i mean just like it just such great work ethic and just yeah as you say it's it's so easy to assume that you got to just outsource the, the mechanical tasks but that's just way undervaluing the incredible service culture that they have in the philippines i'm not, i've been also pretty blown away with the best people mm -hmm. there are just amazing and yeah. also when you look at the cost of hiring somebody of her quality in the uk it would be like five times at least five Probably. six times Absolutely. so yeah okay well so so we're up to what how many people are we up to now i'm roughly um in terms of where i mean not right now in 2020 but so you had in the usa you got those people you got some people in the philippines you basically pinched headhunted and, and stole some great people um mm -hmm. um how many people you're up to at this point and roughly what what data are we up to at that point uh yeah it's an interesting question yeah so we yeah, I just, I guess, give like, yeah, more of a timeline. So I think it makes more sense. So yeah, I think early 2016 is when we started hiring uh, the people in the US. And then, you know, at the time, again, like, you know, I guess, these kind of uh, mistakes that you made. And, and I mean, and then I've seen people execute this strategy really well, it just didn't work as well for us. But you know, we were really focused on hiring like, 
a, you know, a primarily U.S. team. Uh, and then in, I think, early 2017, we ended up struggling uh, definitely financially where some of our products just got hammered, to be totally honest. They just like plummeted overnight. Uh, and so we ended up having to do layoffs at the time. And so we laid off like part of our team in the U.S., part of our team in the Philippines. Uh, and at the time, we probably had maybe seven, eight in the U.S. And then so we kind of went down to half, so to about four of us, including my business partner and I. Um, and then same with the Philippines. And uh, and then from the, and so this is yeah maybe like yeah now mid 2017. And then in the late summer, I had an epiphany of like you know the talent here is like really really incredible like i mean we knew that people were good but then we found some people that were like amazing like way better than what we could hire uh often in the u.s yeah again for like five six times the price and so it's like okay we're we're only going to be hiring in the philippines now or or overseas and it was kind of this big transition of like you know i think uh in the beginning we were kind of thinking like oh man everyone's so cheap and it's kind of like you know when you're traveling in southeast asia you're like oh you're buying everything because like things are so cheap and so you're just like okay this person's good enough uh and i'm paying you know three dollars an hour and so i don't really care but i think when we really started elevating our standard of like no okay this like we should think about this person and joining their team as if we were paying them 50 grand a year or whatever and if they're that good then like we'll continue but it's like you have to be super excited where you're like you have to make an offer Versus of like, yeah, okay, like they're good enough. Uh, and I think once we really started changing that mindset, uh, our team just became way more elevated and we really started focusing on hiring A players. Yeah, that's great. Um, and um, I, I think the, uh, there's some statistics about sort of A players and just the, the level of productivity is so much higher. I think it's like the 80 20 principle kicks in, I guess, isn't it? But mm -hmm. I mean, how you measure this stuff, I mean, you can't measure these things very easily, but you've got, you were putting a dollar value in time. So you must have some idea. And I've heard that, you know, like an A player in any space is going to be worth like five times more than a B player, which I don't know, I don't know how you put statistics on there, but it makes sense in terms of 80 20. Um, principle applies to everything zips law and power laws isn't it so i have to say that um that makes sense um but it's yeah you so you really went through quite the uh quite the transition so do, we entered what 2018 by this point when you, you're having your epiphany roughly uh sorry late, probably like august of 2017 and then yeah. at the time we were maybe eight people and then within the next few months like we went to like uh maybe 20 15 no sorry maybe to like 15 and then we hired like um a part-time recruiter and that's when we like really started scaling so within that year we went probably from like 15 like beginning of 2018 we probably went from like 15 to like 50 60 uh yeah it was crazy within 12 months just because i mean she's amazing um and yeah we really focused on like building out teams putting in managers uh, that's like when we started like bringing like the first, uh, VPs, uh, which is, you know, really considerably different. And I think I didn't really like understand that before as well, like, you know, compared to like managers, um, and yeah, and really just started putting more of like an actual org structure, things like that. Oh, so your your recruiter was <laughs> sounds like you went went a bit sort of crazy on <laughs> recruiting people and from so yeah. you had quite a journey from um like uh two people up to what eight or seven in in the US and seven in the Philippines so fifteen then back down and then mm. back up but only looking for A players and focus on the Philippines and, and overseas generally and then you went up to white like, sort of sixty people in twelve months which is like a four hundred percent increase in stuff. I mean yeah. did you find that that was financially sustainable or had you bitten off a bit more than you could chew at that point? Uh yeah I mean financially it was fine for us. Yeah I mean yeah we didn't have any issues financially. Uh I mean it's definitely really aggressive. I don't know if I would do that again. It was pretty uh it was definitely a very hectic time I would say um but yeah i mean like honestly it did it was a huge key to like our success we like built out a lot of process a lot of things that yeah i mean truly a lot of what we didn't need um but yeah to be fair we also didn't have to like work very hard to like to grow really quickly just because you know um 
we had so many people, which I think could have, we could have definitely done a better job probably automating definitely. Um, but yeah, I mean, we were working probably like 35, 40 hours a week, like, you know, pretty like standard work hours and, and doubling every year pretty much. You you working, what was the doubling period, did you say? Uh, yeah, I mean, we've doubled almost every year, like since inception, uh, like for the most part. So there's some years where we grew like maybe 30, 40%, but like we were pretty consistently like doubling, um, working 35 to 40 hours a week. Wow. So uh, what would you, I mean, that's obviously the dream for a lot of business owners. I mean, like, by the way, dream for some people who are probably not, hopefully not listening to this podcast anymore is, is sit on the beach with your laptop, which is just a stupid idea. In my opinion, mm -hmm. the, the, as James Tramco says, the luxury is going to the beach without your laptop. But for, I think for people who are scaling businesses, the dream is work a solid 30, 40 hour work week, maybe 50 sometimes right. and really, right. and double every year. So what, what do you ascribe that to? Cause that's like the, the um, Holy grail for a lot of people. Yeah. It's a good question. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I definitely think it's, uh, I, I think a huge part of it was our team. I think, you know, this is, like, is going to sound, uh, I guess, very vague, but it's just really focusing on the right things. You know, um, I think I, I've seen, you know, I've seen people that, let's say, focus on Shopify and they have like a good product for Shopify, uh, you know, like a consumable product, for instance. And they can easily like triple their business within 12 months and, and really increase the value and diversify it by focusing on that. But then I, I've seen other people that will spend a ton of money, a ton of time trying to build Shopify with a low price point, not consumable product. Uh, and, you know, they just end up wasting six, eight months and then decide to come back to Amazon because one, it's a lot easier. And two, they've already like kind of proven out that model. Um, and so I think it's, it's really about spending like, yeah, again, like the, your time on the right things. Like I know people that have scaled in supplements and they don't really know their, like their, their numbers, let's say as well as we do, but it's almost brilliant in another sense because they know that their margins are so high. So whether it's, you know, 48 or 52%, like who cares? Like they know that their margins are ridiculously high. And so they don't focus on that. They just focus on like finding other like super, super high, like margin profile uh, products and getting them to the top of Amazon. And so there's like a simplicity in that. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think it just kind of depends on your strategy, but like really spending time planning it is so important and uh, in making sure that you're doing the right things instead of just being busy. <laughs> I'm into that. And uh, yeah, I, <laughs> It's funny um, how easy it is to get into doing things because you're busy, even though you kind of know you shouldn't. Sometimes it's just a habit that it's hard to break, right? right? Do, the, do, the, do these the hardest habits to break, I think, are the legitimate looking ones, like having meetings, answering emails, taking notes is one of my fetishes. I don't know why I did it because you end up with half show notes, half Google SEO, non-friendly things. So that's why one of the things I'm trying to wean myself off. But yeah, that's um, I like what you're saying. So I guess what you're saying is that you've got to have um, for example, what you were describing there, I suppose I would say is a product strategy that marries with your sales channel strategy, for example, mm -hmm. or right. just know what you're good at and, and what's working and focus on that. So for example, getting really high margin products, get another one, scale it to the top of Amazon done, or have a lower margin product, watch the numbers like a hawk, have really clean processes, but not kind of falling between stools or something. Yeah. I mean, low margin, I probably wouldn't even recommend on Amazon. Yeah. It's too volatile. If you're like yeah. doing grocery stores or Costco or something like that, yeah, maybe, maybe it makes more sense if it's like kind of predictable. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think there's just so much volatile and you have purchase orders against it. But yeah, in Amazon, just things move so quickly. I probably wouldn't suggest a high volume, low margin product in my no. Agreed. Too risky. It's it's not the channel for it. Somehow you'll be absolutely right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, look, this has been really interesting. I, your journey's been, and thanks for sharing the sort of nuts and bolts and the some of the, the sort of highs and lows of the journey. Um, mm -hmm. What would you say if you had to give one or even two or three sort of takeaways for people who are looking to scale from, you know, um, let let's say six figures to seven or even better seven to eight, which is more or less what you've been doing recently. Um, mm -hmm. what would your advice around the team be? 
Yeah, uh, I would hire a right hand person as early as you can afford one. Someone like, and especially because a lot of people in, the, in this space are kind of the solo entrepreneurs, which is which is great. And I, you know, I'm so impressed by them because I think it's a lot harder, uh, obviously. And so I would have like, a, a, as soon as you can afford one, like a high level person, you know, someone that was like a manager or a director, or maybe even a VP at another company, uh, whether it's Amazon related or not, but that can really speed up um, your, I guess, development as a business. And, and so like, for me, like, I've never like run a company bigger than this one, right? And so like, I know that there's a lot that I don't know. And so bringing in people that were more experienced, um, that had run larger teams has really helped, um, you know, hiring a CEO coach is one of like our like best hacks. Uh, and th those are definitely a lot more expensive, like, you know, anywhere from two to five grand a year, but like that's been super helpful in terms of, uh, implementing a lot of like process and like, um, just how we look at business. There's, a, there's some really good books around it, like called, uh, traction and scaling up. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think, yeah, getting the right hand person, I think is super key, not compromising on like quality of your talent, like being really excited about the person that you're hiring. I think that's probably like my biggest tip. And then like, yeah, second is like, yeah, getting out of that like day to day of like kind of low value tasks. And so, yeah, like hiring an EA has been transformative for me. Um, uh, you know, getting meal plans delivered, you know, I save a ton of time, like, you know, not cooking, cleaning, going to the grocery store, stuff like that. Uh, but yeah, just like any way that you can just really start like automating stuff, like, you know, using Zapier or whatever you're doing, I think is, is really, really smart. Um, and, um, those are some of like the big hacks I think we've done over the last few years. That's really great. And by the way, that's, that's the first time I've heard that advice, but I've seen it implemented. I know that one of the businesses in the 10K collective that has doubled its revenue pretty much um, for the last two years, anyway, that have been along in, in the group um, has an amazing or had an amazing uh, uh, director, what do you call it? Financial director. And I think they really, really enable them to engineer their cash flow because they didn't have like, you know, crazy profit margins, like 30, 40% usual margins, but mm -hmm. they were able to engineer the cash flow, make sure the books were the sort of thing that the banks would like, make them lendable, and they got substantial loans. And they've, they like like yourself, you know, they, they say growth sucks cash, right? As as Vern Harnish says, in yeah. by the way, scaling up, just an amazing book. Um, Vern totally. Harnish, such a good book. Contraction is really good as well. It's just like a slightly sort of um, more straightforward version of so scaling up or something. I would say in, in my experience, but uh, I haven't read it very deeply. But scaling up, I I, I just think is the bible for companies that are in the sort of six seven figure range wanting to scale to eight nine figures it's just absolutely amazing and i, I don't know, dive down a rabbit hole there but um really great tip i mean that's just brilliant really original and um yeah i've seen it seen it happen so i totally believe you on that one um <laughs> Uh, so great. Thank you so much, Fernando, for coming on and, and sharing that really very interesting um, journey. And uh, if we, people want to hear from you, um, hear more from you or get in touch with you, how do people um, either get in touch or, or hear more from you or if they want to work with you, um, tell us more. Yeah, uh, yeah, you can just reach out via email. So uh, Fernando at marketplaceops.com. Uh, and then, yeah, I'm on Facebook. So you can hit up me up on the Facebook page too, if that's easier. But uh, yeah, Fernando Cruz. Great. We, we ought to give you the, you've earned the right to tell us a little bit about what Marketplace Ops does. Um, tell us a bit what, what you do for entrepreneurs and their companies. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we work with a lot of uh, kind of up and coming kind of like fast growing brands and specifically uh, that want to kind of supercharge their sales on Amazon. And so it's kind of a turnkey solution. We'll handle everything from giving advice uh, on some product development ideas uh, to obviously like optimizing listings and bringing traffic there, helping set up many chat funnels, everything that you would need to like, to really like optimize uh, your presence and, and make the channel a success. So that's um, Fernando at marketplaceops.com. Just remains for me to say many, many thanks for coming on the show. Yeah, man, of course. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it.